This video is made possible by our sponsors, Google, Fonage, and 8x8. See the video description for links and more information. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome again to the Cranky Geek event. This time, I have the Google team. I've got with me Niklas Gloom, Huib Steinhout, and Stefan Holmer. I hope I didn't butcher your names too much. Um, the floor is where yours. I don't think I need to present you any further than that. All right, yeah. So um, my name is Hout Kleinhout. I'm a product manager at Google. And um, the year 2020 was maybe not like uh, the year that uh, was the best of all, uh, but a few things happened. Go to the next slide. So um, we passed the 10 year mark of WebRTC in May this year. And much like the success of internet itself, we can credit the success of uh, WebRTC to the fact that it's based on, on open standards, it's based on um, open source libraries, and um, you can use a free to use codex to, to actually set everything up. Um, also this year, we've been like welcoming several contributions from um, different companies to the WebRTC.org code base. Uh, Microsoft mentioned earlier the optimizations that they're doing. Um, Facebook mentions bug fixes for uh, H.264. So a lot of great contributions from companies using WebRTC now in their products and actually taking a stake in it by um, developing and contributing code. Um, we also saw like that uh, Project Zero has this year um, helped us improve security in uh, WebRTC. They have taken a critical look at uh, the, the architecture itself and the libraries and helped to improve uh, uh, our architecture and, uh, and procedures. Very exciting is that cloud gaming really took off. Um, last year, we talked about Stadia in uh, using WebRTC, pushing the boundaries um, to give super high quality with HDR, 4K, um, surround sound. But this year, also GeForce Now have become available in the browser for Chromebooks, um, Amazon and Microsoft has uh, announced their uh, support for browser-based cloud gaming. So clearly WebRTC has really demonstrated the ability to give ultra low latency and super high quality that uh, cloud gaming needs. We go to the next slide. But most of all, 2020 was the year when real-time communication became really essential. Um, we heard it before, like some services sell 10 to 100x in growth. Um, the Google's own meeting service, Google Meet, uh, saw a growth in the first wave of the pandemic, 30x. Um, and inside the internally in Chrome, we saw like a 17 fold increase in minutes consumed uh, through WebRTC, and later on during the second wave, a 65 times increase. So it's like a stellar uh, increase. And um, uh, everyone started using uh, real-time communication, but also differently. We, we call more, we call with bigger groups, we have longer calls. Um, and this, of course, changed how WebRTC is used. Go to the next slide. Um, and this means like uh, we don't connect just two meeting rooms with a group of people together. We connect 50 people together in individual home environments. Uh, we don't go to grandma anymore on Sundays, but like we have group calls instead. And instead of going to the movies, we like do synchronized watching. Um, we saw also like education uh, in education where schools had to rush through doing homeschooling uh, with video conferencing and then pulling out all kinds of uh, low end laptops to be able to uh, run meetings, seeing the whole classroom and doing multitasking with, uh, with uh, online education software at the same time. This really pushed the needs for performance, as you heard in, uh, in earlier talks, in, in WebRTC and in the browser, but also a flexibility in APIs. So we can't go to Hawaii right now. So at least I want the Hawaii in background in my, in my meetings in the room service and pretend I'm there, uh, which requires like a different type of processing and different types of APIs. Um, most central of it all is, of course, quality, um, audio and video. And Nicholas Bloom, my colleague, will tell a little bit more about what has been happening on the video codex. Thanks, Ulf. I'm happy to give a brief update on video codex. It's always a fun topic uh, and also sometimes a controversial one. So next slide, please. 
I don't think I need to spend much time on H.264 and OVPH. Both codecs uh, since years have been well established uh, in, in all the implementations across the browsers, and they're sent as part of their RTC. In Chrome, we have added VP9 a few years ago, and after it became available in the WebM. And last year, we talked about keyframe SVC, or short KSVC, as an optimization for computing resources and bandwidth efficiencies that we have tuned out. Uh, for multi-streams. In the past, we have talked about AV1 as our goal to convert WebRTC uh, codecs into a next-gen codec. AV1 decode actually exists in Chrome since M70 already, and it uses a David decoder. Um, and compared to VP9, AV1 provides another 30 to 50% of bitrate savings at the same quality. That's a huge improvement. This year, I'm super happy to announce that we are getting close to the finish line for making AV1 happen in WebRTC. So next slide, please. We have added uh, AV1 packetization to the WebRTC earlier this year. It's currently available as AV1X. Standardization in AO Media hasn't been finalized yet. And AV1 can be enabled now already when building Chrome with a build flag using the libAOM encoder. And we have trialed and tuned out and launched AV1 in Google Duo to test if it works for real-time communications, and we have actually seen really great results, especially on the cellular networks for our users in the emerging markets. We have seen great improvements for the objective metrics, like reductions in heat frame rate, and also increase in average frame rate across the board. And yeah, what you see here on the right side, it's obviously a GIF that has been re-encoded, um, probably now in VP8, uh, but it has actually been generated from the actual videos comparing AV1 to H264. But before we can enable AV1 uh, for the overall ecosystem on the web, we need to test that it can work on a wide variety of the hardware and of the bit rates with the RTC settings. So we have to we have, we plan to have the integration with AppRTC already in the next weeks, actually, so before the year ends. And everyone who knows how to compile Chrome can then try it out basically in AppRTC. Um, we are pretty confident that by the second half of the year. Uh, AV1 will become available in Chrome stable for their RTC calls, and I think it will result in a really, really great improvement for video calls for those service providers that make use of it. And with that, I hand over to Stefan. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a bit of an idea of what we have been up to on the Chrome side in the last year. Uh, as uh, Hope mentioned, uh, the pandemic has resulted in a lot of changes when it comes to the number of users that we are seeing using WebRTC. Not a surprise to anyone, I assume. Uh, but it, the, the new users joining also have a much wider set of devices. And a wider set of devices has also uh, made us realize that performance is a hugely important part of WebRTC. And the part that maybe we haven't spent as much time on in the past. So for the six last months, I've been wearing my performance t-shirt. I hope you can see it. Uh, it's starting to get uh, ready for laundry by now, uh, but uh, it has been six fun months. Uh, had this been um, um, an event, uh, where we're all seeing each other, and I could hear what you were saying, I would have asked you what you think is the most uh, computationally expensive part of WebRC in Chrome. Is it encoding video? Is it encoding audio? Video capture? Rendering? And at least to me, uh, starting uh, or in the beginning of this year, I would have said video encoding. But as the use cases have sh shifted, towards larger meetings, uh, we are seeing that rendering is becoming the uh, do video capture in, in HD or, or higher resolution. So as well, and, and especially if you have a, an external camera connected, uh, video capture is also more expensive than, than encoding video. And these are the parts of WebRC that we have spent the most of our time with. So to give you an idea of, of what the problem consists of, 
Uh, here you have a high-level overview of the media path uh, for or the video path of Chrome uh, on the Mac uh, as it is today. You can see that uh, we've highlighted the various video formats that uh, that are being passed around between uh, Mac OS, uh, the various processes of Chrome, uh, and finally the rendering on the right side. And there are a bunch of them, and you could almost say that it's a bit of a mess. Uh, so what we are working on is to try to reduce the number of formats being converted to to a bare minimum. So we're targeting to have a single format across the whole stack. We're trying to make sure that it's always the the best format for the the platform so that uh, it's handled as efficient as possible both on the capture side and on the render side. We have moved motion JPEG decoding, uh, which is often used uh, when you connect external cameras, uh, uh, like a Logitech camera, and you're capturing in, in HD or above. Uh, we have moved the decoding of, of those um, uh, camera frames into Chrome, and we're able to do it much more efficiently there. Uh, in addition to this, we are also making sure that there are no frame copies through the system. Uh, so for instance, on on Mac, we are making sure that we capture frames directly into IO surfaces, uh, and we are passing references to those IO surfaces between the various processes. And like making a conversion or a copy of a, an HD frame is very expensive. So if you can get rid of all of this throughout the stack, you can get substantial improvements. Uh, we have been measuring this uh, on Mac fairly recently, and we're seeing about 15% reduction in power consumption for the media path uh, when using the internal FaceTime camera uh, in HD resolution. And uh, if you plug in an external camera, the gains are much higher. So then we're talking about up to 30% power consumption reduction. And that is uh, unbelievably high uh, and much more better gains that, than I would have expected before starting this project. Um, we are going to also look into, so as we have moved uh, or started copying or capturing the frames into uh, IO surfaces or uh, GPU memory buffers, uh, which uh, are wrapping the IO surfaces uh, in Chrome. We also have the, uh, since we have the frames available on the GPU, we can now use the GPU to do things like much more efficient scaling. Uh, so it will be cheaper to create the simulcast streams. And our goal is gener in general to now focus on making sure that we always keep the frames in GPU memory as much as we can throughout the whole system. The same type of work is being done in collaboration with uh, Microsoft uh, on the Windows side. And we had some prelimin preliminary numbers that show roughly similar gains there. Uh, the Mac uh, improvements we expect to to ship with M87 and M88. Uh, we're experimenting already in M87 with this. And on Windows, we are hoping to have it available in 89. Uh, on Chrome OS, uh, we have had zero copy for, for some time already. So there it should already be available. So the other side of, of the uh, media path is the rendering. And uh, We've heard from multiple talks so already that uh, we are all struggling with getting the grid views uh, in large meetings uh, performing really well. And there are things that you can do. You can scale down the experience in various ways from the application. 
But the most important thing is that we make Chrome handle this use case as well as possible. So we have been looking at that. Uh, there are a couple of things that we are currently experimenting with. Uh, one is to uh, dynamically adjust the page rendering frequency of Chrome so that when you are in a meeting, uh, we will reduce the rendering of the, the rendering frequency of the page from the normal 60 hertz to um, to 30 hertz. Uh, when since that's how how often the, the video usually is updated. Uh, we're also making much better use of hardware overlays, uh, and this uh, also brings uh, significant power consumption reductions. Next, I wanted to talk a bit about our plans for WebRC NV. Uh, the pandemic has also brought with it uh, many new use cases, uh, and, and we see WebRC NV as a way of uh, making it possible for applications to be more flexible, uh, experiment a lot more with how how they configure the the media stack, and to enable uh, more use cases. Uh, the approach that we're taking with Weber CNV is to extend uh, peer connection and make it make new uh, hooks available so that you can plug in your own components uh, into um, the, the media path as the regular HTML streams. Uh, we did this first with insertable streams that enabled end-to-end uh, -end encryption. And we're now doing it also for uh, what we call raw media streams uh, that will enable applications such as uh, uh, video uh, processing and audio processing, like background blur. Uh, and, and this, I think, is most likely just a couple of steps towards the vision where you have much more control over WebRTC. And uh, we do see a path forward where, where we see how peer connection could actually be connected to, to web codecs and give you really, really uh, nice APIs and good control over the full codec uh, um, and, and how it, how it is, is configured. So today, uh, the media flow or the web application has a pretty limited API surface to, to WebRTC. Uh, you essentially have to get user media API and the peer connection API, but underneath there is a lot of other stuff that would be very useful to be able to to deal with and and tweak and and, and change as you want. And uh, what we what we're thinking is that you will be able to plug those in as WebAssembly components uh, running uh, on web workers. So. Where we are today, or what we're getting close to today, is to essentially access the frames uh, uh, after capture and uh, and like apply your video or audio effects, and after decode to apply the effects on on the receiving side. So. We shipped the insertable media streams API with Chrome 86, and we are now happy to announce that we have raw media streams available behind a flag in Chrome 88. We are going to experiment a bit with it, but uh, I'm hopeful that, that we will have something early 2021 that we will all be able to use. And this is a significantly better way of applying uh, video processing on the web then, for instance, uh, the canvas uh, workaround that, uh, that is available uh, today. And with that, I am actually going to try to demo this for you. I'm running Chrome Canary, so you will have to bear with me if it doesn't work. 
So this demo page is uh, already uploaded to, to GitHub and uh, you can find it on the WebRTC samples page. Uh, I'm going to take the camera and here you see the raw media access API fresh from the press. I've applied some funny uh, twist to my video. And uh, yeah, it, it's hard for me to show you what this actually looks like underneath, but uh, feel free to take a look at the so source code. can also put some delay to this video, but I think I will end it with that. Thank you. Thank you to our sponsors. Bonage, creating engaging experiences that move with your customers. See more at bonage.com slash communications dash APIs. 8x8, embed full featured WebRC meetings in your app with the Jitsi as a service beta. Sign up at 8x8.com slash geek. We would like to thank Google for supporting the WebRTC community and this event series. Learn more about WebRTC at webrtc.org.